We're going to pray and get ready to get into this message today. This message is entitled, The Coming One World Order. And uh, really, you guys, this message is an appeal, particularly for those of you who may be joining for the first time, for those of you who may be uh, unfamiliar with, uh, with the Bible or even Adventism. What I'm going to share with you today um, is, is basically an appeal. And, um, you know, I want you to understand that I believe that God wants every person. He is not willing that any should perish. He wants all to be saved. And this sermon today is an appeal. You know, the question was asked in the Bible, what must I do to be saved? And I'm going to add to that, what must I do to remain saved? What must I do to avoid the things that are going to be coming upon the earth according to Bible prophecy. That's what we're going to talk about today. So please join me as we pray, and then we're going to get right into this message, all right? Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord, that you would pour out a special blessing today, Lord, as we open the Word of God. Lord, help me to make this as simple as I possibly can. Help me to take complex themes and uh, juice it down, Lord, so that those who watch will know what they need to do, know how to be prepared for what is coming upon the earth. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the screen. The title of the message, once again, The Coming One World Order. The Coming One World Order. What is the Coming One World Order? What does the Bible say about this one world order? Well, in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 1, the Bible says, John here is speaking, the Bible says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Uh, the, beast which, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Verse, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and the deadly wound was healed. And now notice this last phrase. And all the world wondered after the beast. All right. There it is, everyone. <clears throat> there is the coming one world order. The Bible describes it in these words, and all the world wondered after the beast. It is something that the entire world does in a unified way. This is the one world order where the whole world wonders after the beast, which the Bible says had a deadly wound, and that deadly wound was healed. Now, we're going to get into a little bit later what this beast represents and what this deadly wound is, but I need you to know off the bat that these, the way the beast is described, the, you know, like a leopard and a bear and a lion, these all represent different powers. We're going to come back to that in a moment. But we just want to focus on this idea of the world wondering after the beast. That word wonder, is it, it means to admire. And let me show you what the definition of admire is. So the Bible says again, all the world wondered. All the world wondered. What does that word wonder or admire mean? It means to regard with respect or warm approval, as in, I admire your courage. Look at with pleasure. We were just admiring your garden. So please note here that what the Bible is saying is going to happen is that the whole world is going to look at with pleasure, with admiration, this beast and worship this beast. So the question naturally becomes, hmm, how in the world is the whole world going to admire the same thing? Let me say to you, 
that as we look at the world today, even if we just look at America today, you will see that it is quite difficult to agree on anything, to find a group of people that will agree on anything. There's always disagreement, right? In, so many, in the field of religion, there is disagreement. In the field of politics, there is disagreement. There's disagreement on so many different levels, but the Bible tells us that a time is coming where the whole world will admire this false thing, this false system. Now, if you are a Bible believer, or if you're thinking about becoming a Bible believer, you don't want to be among those who are admiring in this verse. You don't want to be among those who are going to fall in line with this one world order that the Bible speaks about. Put a one in the chat if you're following me so far. We've laid out the fact that there is a one world order that is coming in which all the world is going to wonder after this beast who has this deadly wound that is healed. And they will worship this beast because the deadly wound is healed. They will admire something that the Bible says is false. So, let's go to our next verse verse. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, because the Bible gives this system a name. The Bible says in Revelation 18, verse 1, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and a hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies." And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plague. So the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that this system is called Babylon and that the kings of the earth and all the nations of the earth are going to fall in line with it. So the question is, how? What is it? What is the mechanism that that sets up the entire world to worship, to admire, to commit fornication with this system? Well, the answer is in the text. We're going to look at two mechanisms that will lead to the worship and to falling in line with the one world order. If you can avoid these two things, you are you are good. How many of you want to know what those two things are? All you need to know, beloved, is that if I can avoid this thing A and thing B, then I will not be a part of this one world order that the Bible says the whole world, with the exception, with the exception of those who avoid these two things, the whole world is going to worship. Okay. What is thing number one? Thing number one is right there in the text. In fact, let me go back. Let's go back to the screen and you'll see it right here. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So, so what is the text indicating? The text indicates that those who end up worshiping the beast, those who end up going along with this one world order, are those who are drunk on its wine. Put a five in the chat if you follow that. Oh, okay. This is not talking about literal wine. This is talking about some kind of symbolic wine belonging to this system called Babylon. This beast that has a deadly wound that is healed. Okay, so, Lord, help me to avoid whatever this wine is. Help me to avoid it. Why? Because wine leads to what? Put it in the chat, you guys. Wine leads to drunkenness. 
And when you're drunk, you cannot think straight. When you're drunk, you do things that you regret. So the Bible tells us that one of the ways in which the whole world is going to end up worshiping the beast is because of spiritual drunkenness. Now, let's see what is spiritual drunkenness according to the Bible. Let's go back to the screen and we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah 29, beginning with verse 9, it says this, Stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as words of a book that is sealed which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Uh, uh, the, listen, the, the Bible tells us, let me keep reading, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near with me with, the, with their mouth, and their lips do honor me, but they have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a mighty work among the people. There we go. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a, a marvelous work among the people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of the wise men will perish, and the understanding of the prudent sh men shall be hid. So what is the text telling us here? In this text, the Bible specifically tells us that when a person is drunk, they can no longer or they have no understanding of the vision or the prophecy. They have no understanding of the vision or the prophecy. So one thing we can automatically, uh, 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 one conclusion we can automatically come to here is, wait a minute, those who end up worshiping this system, this thing, those who end up being a part of this one world order do so because they were not aware of the prophetic warnings concerning it. Put a five in the chat if you're following so far. They are drunk, meaning they, they did not understand, they didn't have the wisdom, they had blurred vision. Yes, I like that. Brother Plant, they had blurred vision. They could not see clearly. They did not understand the prophecies of the Bible regarding what was to come. But there's more to this line. So please mark that. Prophecy. That's one thing. Okay, Lord, help me to better understand Bible prophecy. Let's go to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, beginning with verse 3. Proverbs 31, beginning with verse 3, the Bible says, Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the what? The law. And pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy heart. So, the Bible also tells us that those who drink spiritual wine will have a habit of forgetting or rejecting the law of God. Drunken reasoning will lead them to the conclusion that, that the law can be forgotten, that they do not need to be under God or to be keeping God's commandments. Why shouldn't kings drink? And by the way, does God make us kings when we accept Christ? Absolutely, he does. So if we're kings through Christ, avoid wine. 
Why? Because wine perverts the judgment of the afflicted. Wine leads up one to forget the law. Now, why is this so interesting? Because when we go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, note with me, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, the Bible says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which do two things. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you were to go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, you would see there that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So please note this. The dragon is angry with those who keep the commandments of God and have the vision of prophecy, understand prophecy. He's angry with them because he wants to sweep them in with the entire world who is what? Drunk on the wine of Babylon. Drunk meaning they have forgotten the law and their understanding of prophecy, of the visions regarding end times, is blurry. If you have blurry vision, if you have blurry vision, if you do not understand what God has laid out in his word, there is danger. Not only is there danger if you have blurry vision, but there is also danger if you have forgotten or you disregard God's law. In fact, the text we just read said it is not for a uh, beware of women. Babylon is described as a woman who has daughters. She's described as a harlot who has daughters. And the text says, do not give your strength unto women. Do not drink wine. We're not talking about literal women here. We're talking about a fallen system. And in fact, if you note with me in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20, let's go back to the screen. In Proverbs 6, verse 20, the Bible says, my son, Keep thy father's commandments and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou wakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproof of instructions are the way of life. Watch this to keep thee from the evil woman from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids, for by means of a whorish woman, a harlot, mystery Babylon, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, for by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Beloved, in essence, what I'm trying to tell you right now is very simple. We might sum it up in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, which says this. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Beloved, if you want to avoid what the Bible says is certainly coming upon the world, we've got to do this. We've got to get into the word of God. We've got to study to show ourselves approved. What are we studying? We're studying the word of God to better understand God's law, to better understand the prophecies, particularly in the books of Daniel and Revelation, which pinpoint what's going to happen at the very end of time. Study to show ourselves approved. Are y'all with me so far? This is a simple appeal, beloved. Let's not take people's word for what the Bible says. Study to show yourself approved. In fact, Remember, we started off with this beast that the whole world is going to end up worshiping. Th this beast that looked like a lion and a bear and a leopard and then, and then a dragon. And I want you to note with me where this actually comes from. In fact, notice with me, notice with me, Revelation 19, verse 10. We talked about this a little bit earlier. I fell at his feet to worship him, John writes. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus, 
the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So remember, the dragon is angry with those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, and the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Meaning, the dragon hates those who seek to get a better understanding of prophecy because prophecy reveals the movements of the dragon before he makes them. Prophecy reveals the movements of the enemy before the enemy makes his moves. So that when this one world order comes around, <coughs> those who have been studying prophecy know, oh yes, Bible already warned us. I'm not falling for that. I know this. I understand. I know what this is. So, so then, who is this beast? What does this beast represent? Come on, let's go back to the book of Daniel, and we're just going to do a very short study here, very short, uh, 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 quick study just on these beasts, to, and we're, then we're going to get back to the main point of this message. Now, this is part of the message, but just follow along. In the book of Daniel, chapter 7, there are four beasts that are described. They are a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dragon. Just as Revelation chapter 13 described, you got the same thing happening in Daniel chapter 7. And to juice this down, these beasts represent different kingdoms. You can see that in Daniel chapter 7 verse 19. A beast is symbolic of a kingdom. So the first beast is a lion, which represented the kingdom in which Daniel was living when he wrote this. Daniel chapter 7, the lion represents the Babylonian empire. The second beast would be a bear that overthrew the lion. That would be the empire of the Medes and the Persians. The third beast was a four-headed leopard, which would symbolize the rise, the rise of the Grecian Empire, the kingdom of Greece. And then the fourth beast, a dragon having ten horns, would symbolize the kingdom that took the place of the Grecian Empire. That would be Rome. Please note with me that this fourth beast has 10 horns representing the divisions of Rome after the fall of Rome. And we know that this happened. When Rome fell, it was divided into various barbarian tribes. And then out of these 10 horns, or in the midst of these 10 horns, rises what the Bible calls a little horn power. This little horn power represented a religious system that rose out of Rome. This religious system that rose out of Rome basically represented a Roman Christian system. The, the history calls it the papacy. Now, <clears throat> this papal system was in essence a church state entity. And with that church state entity came persecution. So the book of Daniel talks about this power that would persecute people that would think to change God's laws and think to change God's times. And he would do it for a period of what the Bible calls over 1,260 prophetic days, meaning 1,260 prophetic years. And beloved, if you look at history, you will see that this is exactly what happened. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Rome falls into various barbarian tribes, and out of those fallen kingdoms rises this, this, this particular power that is a mingling, an amalgamation of church and state. Thus, in Revelation chapter 13, when the Bible says that this is the beast that received a deadly wound, it is telling us that there was a time coming that this entity that was a church and state actually received a deadly wound in its separation. Church and state were separated, causing a deadly wound to be inflicted upon the head of this beast. Thus, when the Bible tells us that the deadly wound would be healed, what it is saying is that 
an amalgamation of church and state is going to return. And all I need y'all to do right now, beloved, is just think with me for a moment. Do you see in what's happening in today's society a desire within Christian churches to gain political power as it was in the Dark Ages? Absolutely. We are heading there. The Bible forewarned that it is coming and we are actually living in a time where anybody, people who wear glasses, who have the poorest vision can see, oh yeah, there's a Christian movement afoot today that is saying that we need to restore Christianity in power and Christianity needs to be running America. It's happening right before our eyes. But the question now is this. Well, how can this even be pulled off? Because remember, you have Muslims and you have a, a, a Buddhist and you have atheists and you have people that don't agree on anything. So, so okay, I get the wine part and it looks like many Christians, the, re the reason why they're getting caught up in this is because they're drinking wine. But what about the rest of the people? What about the, the Muslims and the atheists who, who, who are not partaking of that wine? The wine of Babylon. The false teachings that, 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 that are hide under a garb of Christianity. Those who are, who are not really studying the word of God. Okay, we get that. It looks like many so-called professed Christians are, are drinking this wine because they're, they've thrown the law of God behind their back. And, 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 and they just, oh, prophecy, you know, what, all kinds of weird, strange prophecies that are not in line with what the Bible is actually saying. So then how about those who don't follow or don't claim to be Christians? Well, this brings us to the second ingredient. So the first ingredient is wine. We know that those who drink the wine are going to end up being a part of this one world order. What is the other thing? Come with me to Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. And um, we're going to read, beginning with verse 13. <clears throat> John says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Reading on. For they are spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. How interesting is that? The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 and 14, that the other thing that is going to play a role in gathering the whole world together are miracles, false miracles. So the one thing, wine, okay, pastor, help me to remember, Lord, help me to remember, pastor said, we got to avoid the wine, but there's also the miracles. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 24, verse 23, please note what Jesus himself said. He said this, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Reading on, Revelation 13, verse 13 and 14. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. I need y'all to understand that the Bible is telling us that the two things that are going to sweep in the entire world is one, wine, and two, miracles. If the wine doesn't get you, 
the miracles will. And if the miracle doesn't get you, the wine will. That is, if you're not paying attention to these two things, if you're not understanding, okay, Lord, help me to know that, that, that if I'm studying the word of God to show myself approved, it's going to help me to avoid both the wine and depend not on miracles, but on a thus saith the Lord. Because, beloved, let me tell you, let me talk about these frogs for a second. The frogs remind us of the plagues of Egypt. And you'll remember that, that the significance about the frogs, and you may not know this, but I'm about to tell you. So you're about to see and understand. When, when, when Moses and Aaron went into Egypt and began these miracles, remember first they turned the, 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 the water into blood, or first they, they threw the rod down and the rod became a serpent. And the magicians counterfeited that miracle. And then they turned the water to blood and the magicians counterfeited that miracle. And then they brought the frogs up. Now the frogs were the second plague. And what did they do? The magicians counterfeited that miracle. But after that, they could no longer counterfeit any of the other miracles that Moses did. Therefore, the frogs in Revelation chapter 16 are pointing us to the last counterfeit that will happen before the end of the world. The last counterfeit that draws the whole world together. The last thing the devil will be able to counterfeit to, 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 to unite the whole world together. And the Bible tells us that that last thing is Satan appearing as Jesus himself. Now, I want you to think about the significance of that, y'all. The reason why Jesus warned let no man deceive you. Many shall come in my name saying, uh, 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 saying, uh, saying I am Christ. The reason why Jesus, in fact, let, let me do this. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians very quickly. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Watch, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Please understand this. That the final miracle before the second coming of Christ is a counterfeiting of God so that someone is appearing as Jesus Christ saying, I am Jesus. Why is this significant? You need to understand, beloved, that for an atheist, seeing is believing. Atheists are always saying, you know what, if Jesus is real, then let me see him, then I believe. Well, guess what, beloved? When these miracles occur, every atheist in the world, all the Muslims, all the Buddhists, all the people of all these other religions that are non-Bible religions, all of them come together. Okay, it's real. We're seeing it with our own eyes. So for the Christian world, they've drunk of the wine. The professed Christian world, they've drunk of the wine. They threw the law of God behind their back. Christians threw the law of God behind their back. Christians didn't, didn't care to study for the prophecies. Oh, we can't understand it anyway. And so when this happens, it's like, oh, well, yeah, it's Jesus. And then for the secular world, for those who are like, oh, we hate God and we hate the Bible and we hate everything and ha, 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 none of this is real. When they see the miracle, because for them seeing is believing, guess what? They join in too. I got this. I see it now. Yeah, Jesus is real. They believe that this impersonator is actually Jesus when it is a counterfeit. It is Satan himself impersonating Jesus Christ. Listen to what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14. It says, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. 
Beloved, if you don't understand prophecy, if you are not studying to show yourself approved, if you're taking other people's word for it and just kind of like going along with it, beloved, listen, you are going to end up in the new world order. And, 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 and this message today is a simple appeal. Listen, we got to start studying the Bible for ourselves. We have to get deeper into the word of God. Listen to what Matthew 24, what is, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 24. It says in verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And the first thing Jesus says about what kicks off the end of the world, he says, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. In Matthew, same chapter, Matthew 24, verse 22, he says, And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Behold. I have told you before, wherefore, if they say unto you, behold, these in the desert, go not forth. Behold, these in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning shineth, and lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Let me say it again, beloved. The overwhelming nature of this miracle is the only thing possible that can bring the entire world together. So on one hand, it is the wine. On the other hand, it is the miracles. Put those things together, you now know, okay, if I'm drinking the wine, I'm gonna end up worshiping Babylon. If I go for the miracles over the written word of God, I'm gonna end up worshiping, the, I'm gonna end up uh, um, as, as, uh, uh, as part of this new world order. Listen, y'all, it is the word of God in both cases that prevent you from going with the wine and going with the miracle. Because, beloved, remember, remember how Satan came to Jesus in the wilderness and said, perform a miracle, and Jesus responded how? It is written. It is written. And so many of us are willing to put a miracle over. The, if a miracle happens, we'll go, well, I believe in a miracle over what the Bible says. If the Bible says X, Y, and Z, but a miracle with the name of Jesus attached to it shows opposite from what the Bible says, so many of us will be willing to go with the miracle over what the word of God says. And that's the danger, you guys. When you trust in miracles over the word of God, when you trust in signs over the written word of God, you are already in danger. Listen to what the Bible says in Revelation 13, verse 8. The Bible says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So now I'm going to simplify this with, for you. And then we're going to get ready to close this out. All who worship him are those whose names are not written in the book of life. So now we can even simplify it even further. Hmm. So if my name is written in the book of life, that means I'm not going to worship him. Okay. So how do I get my name or keep my name in the book of life? Okay. Come on, let's go and then we'll, then we'll wrap this up. John 1 verse 4. John 1 verse 4. Um... <clears throat> Let me come back to this. John 1 verse 4. The Bible says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. If I want to be in the book of life, then I've got to be in Jesus. So that's the first thing. Okay, how do I get in the book of life so I can avoid the wine and avoid the miracles, the false miracles? My name needs to be in the book of life, which means my name needs to be in Jesus because he is the life. So help me then. To be in Christ. If I'm in Christ and life is in him, then my name is now in the book of life. What about this? John 17 verse 3 tells us, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Okay, so, so life eternal is to know Jesus Christ. It is to know the Father. All right. So then... I got to know Jesus 
I've got to know the Father. I have to be in Christ. I have to accept Christ. But look, so many people accept Christ. And you're saying, Pastor, that there are those who are claiming Christ who are not going, who are going to, who are drinking the wine and who are going to be deceived by the miracles. If it were possible, even the very elect. Okay, so hold on. How do we, how do we, how do we reconcile this then? How do I know if I know Christ? Oh, 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 well, let me share with you. <clears throat> let me share with you. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and verse 4 says this. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is drunk. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is going with a strange and adulterous woman. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments does not have his name in the book of life because to have your name in the book of life is to know God and is to know Christ and it is to be in Christ. But if you say you know me, but you are drinking, if you say you know me, but you are drinking that wine, that counterfeit teaching, that says, don't worry about the Bible, don't worry about prophecy, don't worry about the commandments of God, then know that you don't know me. But you can get to know me. Just because you don't know me doesn't mean that you can't get to know me. He invites us to get to know him. The Bible says in Revelation 21, verse 7, verse 27, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, nor worketh a worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are in the written in the book, in the Lamb's book of life. So no one can enter in that maketh a lie. And what is a lie? He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. <clears throat> All who claim to know Jesus, Lord, 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 have we not done X, Y, and Z in your name? Have we not done miracles in your name? And Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. What is iniquity? It is transgression of God's law. Jesus said in John chapter 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now watch this, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. What is this Spirit of truth? Who is this comforter? Oh, let me read it again. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit <clears throat> of prophecy. Beloved, the spirit of prophecy is the same spirit <clears throat> that guides us into all truth. It is the same spirit that the holy prophets spoke of of old that led them to write what they wrote. In other words, it's as if <clears throat> God is saying, listen, if you take my word, if you study my word, if you receive me into your heart and keep my commandments, the law, I'm going to send my spirit, the spirit of prophecy, and both of these things, the spirit of prophecy and the law, will keep you. The law will keep you from the wine and the spirit of prophecy will keep you from the false miracles. I'm equipping you for the last days. I'm equipping you, for, I'm equipping you to be able to stand against the wine on one hand and the miracles on the other hand. If you have me in you and if you're keeping my commandments because you love me, then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to enable you to stand against the false teachings and I'm going to enable you to have power to stand against the miracles when they start to, uh, when they start to come, when, when 
this overwhelming deception that will come upon the whole world happens, your faith will be stable. You will not go along with the one world order. So, <clears throat> my appeal, again, it's right there on the screen, and it is very simple. We're going to pray. Here is the appeal, you guys. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Listen to me. There are way, way, way too many people who are depending upon others for their understanding of truth. And if those people say, hey, this is wrong, then they're like, hey, this is wrong, without any understanding for themselves of why something is wrong or even why something is right. Because you can follow what is right blindly too. Did y'all hear what I just said? You can follow what is right blindly. And if you're following what is right blindly and do not understand for yourself why it is right, it is just as crazy as following what is wrong blindly. <clears throat> so for those of you who are saying, all right, Lord, it's time for me. I need to stop depending upon other people and really have an understanding of the word of God for myself. I want to understand prophecy better. I want to understand the Bible better. I want to understand God's will for my life better. Help me, Lord, to none but those who have fortified that their minds with the truths of God's word will stand in the last great crisis. I promise you, you guys. No matter what denomination you are right now, no matter... I am appealing to you to go deeper in the word of God than you ever have before because there are many winds of doctrine that are blowing and many people being taken away by winds of doctrine. So if it's your desire, Lord, I need to go deeper in the scripture. I don't care who you are right now. Like, I don't care what denomination... I, Lord, I need to go deeper in the scriptures. I want you to put that one in the chat. Put that one in the chat. It's, it's your way of raising your hand and saying to the Lord, all right, Lord, like, I just need to be, I just need to get deeper into your word. I need to be a better student of the Bible. I need to learn how to study this thing for myself and be convicted for myself. Not because what I heard someone say, not because of even what I heard pastor say today, I need to be able to be convicted on my own and to be able to stand for what I believe by myself so that I will not fall for the wine and I will not fall for the miracle. Praise God. I see all those ones in the screen. I see all those ones <laughs> and I even see the Juan in a million. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for your appeal for us to study to show ourselves approved. Lord, please guide us into all truth. You promised. You said we will seek you and find you if we search for you with all our hearts, Lord. And many are lost because they've taken directions for, uh, from other people without checking those directions themselves. So Lord, please speak, speak to us, open our eyes, help us not to have blurry visions, help us Lord, not to fall for the wine, nor to fall for the miracles. Lord, I want you to, I see Lord, you see all those ones in the chat, Lord, please respond and grant these people a deeper experience in the word of God. Thank you for hearing and answering this prayer because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen.